Hello, welcome to the World Bank Group's Econathon. It's our first day-long live stream around the globe discussing important topics on economics and development. During the next 24 hours, we are coming to you live from the World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C., and from the regions where we work. We are discussing how strong economics, finance, statistics, and data support our mission to alleviate extreme poverty and build shared prosperity. Since the World Bank was founded 75 years ago, it has become a leader in development finance with deep analytical expertise that supports our lending and advisory work in developing countries. During the Econathon, you'll hear from World Bank Group economists and experts who are working on country programs and projects to highlight the value of data and research, such as the Women, Business, and Law Analysis and the Doing Business Indicators that help catalyze reforms in country. You will also hear from our clients, the people we work to help. We want to stimulate new thinking and share knowledge about the solutions to the world's toughest challenges and how we can come closer to prosperity for all. I hope you will join us as we look at the challenges, progress, and potential for reducing poverty and improving lives everywhere in the world. I hope you will join our Europe and Central Asia region over the next two hours to see the challenges, progress, and potential for reducing poverty and improving lives throughout the region. Hi. Welcome to Tashkent uh, and Europe and Central Asia's segment of the World Bank's first ever 24-hour Econathon. My name is Vinny. I'm the senior country economist here in Tashkent. And uh, we're at the non uh, factory in the middle of Chorsu Bazaar. Uh, if there's anything that unites this region, uh, it's bread. We have a really, really good lineup for you today. A really diverse set of people to talk to you about our issues. And if anything, we wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of this wonderful region. Later on in the show, we're going to go live to Washington, D.C., where the ECA chief economist, Asle, is going to host regional experts to talk to you about some of the profound changes that are underway in the ECA region. We've also shot a really cool feature for you right here in Tashkent to take you through some of the historic changes that are underway since the last two years. But it's not just about Uzbekistan. So let's go to an interview with Cyril Mueller, our regional vice president, to talk about some of the changes happening across the region. Cyril was in town last week where I had the opportunity to sit with him and have a discussion. Cyril, after three visits since I started working here in Tashkent, uh, I'm really excited to extract my pound of flesh from you. Thanks so much for sitting down for our interview. Really looking forward to hearing from you about Ica, about Uzbekistan, so I can't wait. This was a really exciting visit. It's an extremely uh, fascinating moment in the history of Uzbekistan. And for us at the World Bank, it's probably one of our more exciting programs in the world over. Um, the country is going through not only what we typically call economic reforms, but it is a very deep transformation that has political, social, and economic dimensions. So my first question for you, Cyril, is, you know, we're now at about 30 years of transition in ICA. Uh, it's a region that's, been, uh, that's seen a whole number of bustling transitions come and go. Uh, and now we're in the midst of, a, of an intense one here in Uzbekistan. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what's happened over these 30 years? What are the ups and downs of these transitions and what has worked and what have some of the challenges been? Well, actually, uh, if you think of transition, um, it all came, all transitions came out of crisis. And so in crisis moments, these are the times at which you also try to reinvent yourself and to really challenge yourself. So in the case of ECA countries, probably the, some of the main achievements you would look today, if you were to compare, let's say, visiting in the mid-1990s, a country like Romania, a country like Poland, and you were to come today, no citizen of these countries would have thought they would be members of the European Union. So the economic achievements have been very significant. On the other hand, you will also say that some of the challenges in transition that we did not maybe anticipate in the early days are still with us today. In a way, it's a set of incomplete transitions. And I want to focus on one issue, which is around institutions. Maybe at the beginning we thought that creating markets, 
bringing in competitions, making sure incentives would be there, um, and believing in a set of core values would be sufficient for, let's say, the type of prosperity that had been achieved in Western Europe to then replicate itself in Eastern Europe and then in the former Soviet Union. And that's one of the challenges we faced at the time is it, we probably underestimated the complexity of creating a set of institutions that are fit to basically meet the challenges of the modern global economy. And I think this is true in all countries. Now, let's be fair also that all countries today are basically facing that challenge of being fit for the future. So that is one thing that I'm a bit concerned in ECA countries, and that's where we are focusing at the World Bank, is really to say, OK, certain achievements, very important, uh, good integrations into world markets, a strong human capital base, integrations into markets. But now, OK, where is this region going to be in the futures, and what are the key assets of this region? And for me there, I think the dimension that we're really focusing on is institutions and human capital. So that gets me thinking a little bit. You know, one of the one of the jobs that I have here on the ground, as you know, and we work together, you know, over the last uh, few days in your visit. Um, you know, we often get asked questions by policymakers around, you know, what 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 among these lessons from ECA can we actually distill, and how do we apply them in Uzbekistan? I am taking on. Uh, in a way, the sum of the work we do in the countries when I do visits like this. So let me focus on three uh, areas. There was, an, and I think you will have with uh, our viewers, you will have a set of segments later on that show really life in Uzbekistan and how it is changing. So there are set, a set of initial transformations that we would not have ever guessed three, four years ago. So for instance, Peoples are expressing their voices. People can have, have many more choices. But also you have an ability in, today in Uzbekistan to basically travel, to engage in trade, to create businesses, to try to think about future, to focus also having choices for the future or in, of your children. Um, so after this initial wave of big changes, Today, we're very much focusing on two things. One, as Uzbekistan needs to continue to grow robustly, it will be about bringing in, mobilizing investment. And there, in mobilizing investment, one of the key is to make sure that this investment comes from reputable investors, be they domestic or foreign, and also that all of those transactions on investment are really productive and basically follow due process. And that is something that we've been focusing on in sectors like energy, like in the financial sector, but very much so also in agriculture. So that has been a big focus on the discussion. The second focus of discussion has been the other side, how to make sure that as the economy grows, issues of disparities, for instance, across regions, rural, remote areas, and urban areas, or also to make sure that the economic opportunities created by the transformation are really shared by all in the population. And there, I think, in Uzbekistan, this is a very young nation with young people. The issue of jobs and creating jobs, making sure also that vulnerable groups are, have access to opportunities or that also some of their situations are mitigated by social assistance programs. So on one hand is the excitement of growth and investment. On the other one is on making sure that it is shared and that that sharing takes into account the poverty dimension. Look, I wanted to do one more thing. Uh, you know, I know that your time is short, uh, but there's one last thing that I wanted to do with you. And it's an eco question, but it's going to be an eco question with a really close friend of mine. So I'd like to introduce you to Vlad. Oh. Vlad, like me, has no hair, and uh, you know we're pretty proud of that. We have uh, we're completely comfortable with that, and uh, you know I don't think he himself, this Vlad, is not 95 years old. But you know we're approaching. You know I think we were just we were just discussing about 95 years since uh, since Lenin passed away. Let's say you were walking down the street in in an Ica, in an Ica city or a capital, uh, let's say Warsaw or Yerevan, uh, and you bumped into Vlad, and you guys went into a chaikana to have a cup of tea. What would, you, what would you talk about? What do you think, you know, what, a, 
what are the ups and downs that you'd love to tell Vlad about how things have gone since, since uh, you know, these in the last 95 years? Wow, 1924 versus 2019. Well, I think probably the one thing that would be most striking is how, in a way, these, any country, any town in this region would have changed. Because today, I would have hoped that he would have traveled. He will see that basically, if you visit Yerevan today, if you visit Warsaw today, you will see more similarities than you will see differences. And that is, I think, something that globalization brought, but also very much a set of aspirations from uh, populations, in this case, in urban populations. Um, I would also probably, he would probably be very surprised by how democratic technology services opportunities are. Because the, the Soviet to the revolution took place in a country that was very, very different, 19th century uh, type of situation. The third thing I would love to do, discuss probably with Vlad, is the whole area around, whole issue around human capital. Uh, because it is something to recognize that there was a lot of effort in terms of prioritizing universal services, education, health. And there were centers absolutely of excellence. There was also significant achievements, for instance, in gender equality. Today, some of the countries that came out of the Soviet tradition are struggling today with actually losing some of those uh, strength. And we are very much in discussions with ECA clients to actually focus on what does it take for people to be productive citizens in the future. And there, having this strong capital stock is definitely an asset, but what we want to make sure is that it retains and grows over time with some of the qualities that uh, came about from that period. That's probably what I would talk. Cyril, thank you. I mean, I think it's been a, it's been a very short but very interesting interview with you. Uh, I hope it gives our viewers a little bit of a flavor for a region that we're both extremely passionate about. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now that you've had a chance to listen to some of the World Bank perspectives, let's go across and listen to some real stories of change in Uzbekistan. We're here today in historic Chorsu Bazaar. It's really where the DNA of this country runs like a river. One of the oldest bazaars in the world, a Silk Road legacy. And we're in the textile market at the moment, where we're going to take a short walk and uh, talk to you a little bit about the story of Uzbekistan. Why Uzbekistan, you must be wondering. Well, you know, two years ago, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. This is a story of profound change. Two years ago, there would be all sorts of controls, lockdowns, very few people here, very little shopping. And now you can see that it's already starting to change. We have the freedom to have this conversation. Two years ago, 50% of the country's foreign exchange was being traded in markets like this. 50% of all of our foreign exchange needs here in this country in the black market through the bazaars. And now 98% of that is moving through the banking system. It's a story of incredible economic change. And coinciding with that is also a profound story of social change. It's a changing society, a changing face where people are more free to go about their daily business, more free to practice their religion. It is a story of incredible change. That started about two years ago with a reformist president, Mirziyoyev, declaring his intentions to transform the country. And so we thought we'd spend a little bit of time with you here today to talk about that transformation, the good and the bad, and some of the challenges too. 
we're going to talk to a number of people over the course of this video. Journalists, business people, some people from government, all to understand better what is happening in this amazing country in this amazing time of change. We're going to have a sit-down conversation with Odil Bekisakov. Odil was an HSBC investment banker who came from London last year to help manage the Eurobond process. And following Uzbekistan's almost fairy tale like issuance, he has been appointed Deputy Finance Minister a few months ago. We're going to sit down with Odil to talk a little bit about all that's changed in Uzbekistan and how the government is leading the charge. You know, from a visiting friend and relative to a Eurobond uh, advisor to now a Deputy Minister of Finance. Can you talk to us a little bit about this, uh, you know, what inspired you to come back? But also talk to me a little bit about the, the highs and the lows of this transition. I want to understand as well what it's like for, for you to come back and, and some of the challenges. 2016, when president was elected, this marks a historic change. And uh, like many Uzbeks, here and abroad, we felt it. We really felt the change, the dynamism of the president and his government. He invited us. 17 autumn, when he went, visited the U.S., he, he met with a group, um, group of Uzbek uh, diaspora. And in that meeting, he invited people um, who are working abroad and who are needed uh, in, in Uzbekistan. Um, and that's huge. And, and plus, all the reforms, uh, all the change that we've heard happening or we've read happening while in London also makes you want to read news stories every day, right? We, I was checking uh, Uzbek news websites on a daily basis, maybe several times in a day. And funny enough, our dull websites, um, boring stories became much more interesting because you, you could feel there's a freedom of media coming as well. So this change was huge. Um, late, I was having a dinner with a friend, and then I got a call from Tashkent. And, and here I hear Mr. Kuchkarov. Who's the Minister who wants, of Finance, right? Minister of Finance, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, I met him. I, I, uh, I had met him before when I came to Tashkent, very briefly, and uh, we, 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 we presented him on Eurobond, as the government was planning to do, and this is something I knew um, how to do. I presented a few ideas here and there, and he remembered me. Then he called me about uh, three weeks later, uh, when I was traveling, and I had no idea that he's going to call me. Then we had a quick discussion, and then he said, look, this is exactly what we're going to do. Um, will you be interested to come? And he's a very tough guy to say no to. <laughs> I didn't say no. I said, let me give, give me some time. And then I, I ran this scenario over and over my head. And next day, I went back to London, uh, discussed with my wife and some of my friends. Not everyone was supportive, uh, just because of the comfort that we created there and the, the risks of risks that I could potentially face uh, back in Tashkent. Not risks per se, but um, new thing, right? Uncertainty. New thing, uncertainty, which obviously uh, needed to be taken into account. So I said, well, in a couple of days, I called him back and I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, now in your role as Deputy Minister of Finance, I have the, I have the pleasure of asking you some harder questions about sure, the reform please program. Do. And, um, you know, when you look back and uh, when the government looks back over the last two, two and a half years, what would you think are kind of the three most challenging, most difficult reforms that you think you've had to implement? I would say I think the most impressive one is liberalizing the bread prices because we can liberalize electricity. We, ha we still haven't done it, but we will do it. Um, and, and you liberalize many other things, but the bread is the most important one. It's psych people are psychologically attached to, the, to, to, to bread. And, and and people remember that uh, because generations after generations, you are taught that you have to protect the bread. You never in Uzbekistan, people never throw bread into the uh, street, or, or, or uh, they don't waste it. They don't even turn it upside down. That's <laughs> so we have we have that so much respect in bread, yeah. and bread price liberalisation had most um, 
both economic, psychological and culturally um, difficult. Uh, but it, it was needed to be done. Um, it was needed to be done in the sense that uh, government is now moving away from blanket subsidies into more targeted subsidies. And, and immediately uh, when the bread prices were liberalized, uh, we had to uh, start uh, giving these targeted subsidies to vulnerable people. Um, to the same amount as, <laughs> as if they were uh, buying the bread. Uh, uh, Through the social safety nets. Exactly. Um, so that uh, was probably the second most important decision. But again, we, we're still talking about balancing the, the, balancing the economy or finding the right balance using the, the, the broader macroeconomic f framework. Because if you liberalize the bread, the next, next thing you do is the wheat and the whole chain. So, uh, and, and, and you have um, supply and, uh, and demand um, pushing or pulling the prices. When we fix everything and government is, um, government is dictating the prices based on non-market pri non practice, uh, there will be distortions. Some people will get, um, you know, cheap electricity or cheap gas at the expense of something else. At the expense of investments in our case, uh, that needs to be covered either by the state budget or, or we have to import utilities. And, and that's obviously, that makes a lot of sense. But I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the government strategy when it comes to social inclusion. What, what inspires the government to do this? You know, um, you know, how, how, how is it thinking about you know, social inclusion in the future? What does it mean to the government to actually be inclusive? Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question, actually. Um, when people talk about reforms, often people don't uh, mention uh, much about uh, social impacts of these reforms. The and, face of the reform. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and one of the, one of the key components of, of President's reform agenda is ensure there's social inclusion, ensure that uh, we can protect the most vulnerable people when we actually liberalize, you know, bread prices I already mentioned, electricity prices, um, and, and, and when, when there are um, opportunities that the reforms are creating, uh, will offer these opportunities to, um, let's say, um, people in villages, in remote areas, people without capital or without access to credit. So one of the, one of the uh, examples uh, of, uh, of, of, of such programs is uh, every family is an entrepreneur program. Uh, government is spending six hundred million dollars, equivalent, um, and uh, they are offering loans to families without collateral, uh, up to three years, up to five years. It is at uh, again at prefer uh, at discounted um, rate. Uh, it's at eight percent versus sixteen percent of central bank rate. But I think this is one program that I feel comfortable in continuing. The, the government's intention right now is to ensure that these families can create employment for themselves. And, and those credits, those um, uh, programs, uh, want to achieve this um, ambition, making sure that each family, they can get this uh, funding from the government um, and they can uh, start um, their own business, be it uh, uh, raising a cattle or, or greenhouses, which has been rather popular in rural areas nowadays, or other activity. Uh, they can also uh, use one, of, one room in their, in their, in their house to uh, do textiles like this uh, and many other activities. Um, so. I think this is um, the right policy, something that we should continue going forward uh, to achieve the social inclusion. Um, and I mentioned already that uh, um, uh, the targeted subsidies is the right way to go. Um, uh, so I think uh, the government, to my knowledge, uh, we will continue targeted subsidies when we liberalize prices uh, to ensure that the most vulnerable our low-income households are protected from, from this wave of reforms. Um, I could spend all day there. You know, one of the best things about change here in the last two years is the changing face of trade regulations and export liberalization and domestic trade liberalization. You know, in the last two years, traffic to these markets has increased. 
sellers are, are reporting much better stories of sales. So today we're going to talk to Zafar Kashimov. Zafar is the CEO and founder of Korzinka, Uzbekistan's largest supermarket chain. Zafar is going to talk to us a little bit about what it, you know, what it felt like to run a supermarket chain during that era of controls. What's changed, what hasn't changed, and what are the challenges that still remain, both for his business but also for Uzbekistan. Two years ago, before these reforms started, uh, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what it was like. Um, you know, you still had a big business that was working in that environment. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you faced? I, I first organized my uh, business company in uh, uh, 1994. So I, I really have a good memory of uh, how things were developing here. Uzbekistan, uh, like you know, everybody knows, was quite very closed economy was uh, maybe one of the uh, most uh, strict uh, currency regulation, uh, import regulation. Uh, uh, a lot of big parts of economy was under government control, very restricted. And um, my positiveness actually comes from that in when uh, things started to change in 2016, then 2017, you know, I, I, I went, I'm so optimistic now because like these three years is really more than all those 20 something years which was preceding. You know, what, what were the big challenges and how did they actually impact you as a businessman and for your business? Well, um, I would say like, you know, the, like um, doing very simple things in business was always a challenge. Uh, be it like registering company would take, would be taking some longer time and the bureaucracy, uh, closing companies even worse, uh, like do, engaging in export or import operations was very difficult. So many like you know we were I remember times we were registering the same contract in uh, several uh, government and bank offices like customs, foreign trade ministry, uh, banks, etc. And, uh, you know, just making a small amendment in some document could take like long times. But uh, above all, it was a uh, hard currency restriction. Above all, it was hard currency. I I'll tell you, like, you know, to source our businesses, to source because we sell consumer goods and not all consumer goods being produced in Uzbekistan. We should uh, we, we were always and uh, still uh, rely on a lot of import supplies. So uh, to get access to hard currency, was the biggest challenge of a business. I, I, I think that I, I'm not, uh, I, like, you know, I, I'm not far from a truth. If I say 70% of my uh, actually physical, like, effective time at job was devoted to get uh, access to uh, sources of hard currency. Uh, because, like, you know, uh, traditional way, like, just applying for a bank, uh, it, it was not uh, possible, like, uh, there were sometimes during that 22 years, maybe it was a little easier or uh, tougher, but generally uh, it wasn't accessible. Well, uh, in uh, September of 17, beginning of September, as you know this very well. Uh, and that's that, my next question that for you. Anyway. Everything <laughs> gone just uh, uh, like, you know, overnight. Since then, uh, this, the size of our business tripled. We, we, we were, yes, we were like 22 stores then. And uh, now we're 64 stores. You know, we started to develop our chain. We started to build more shops. We started, you know, because uh, so much energy, uh, uh, Fried, and uh, also, you know, uh, other thing I would say, the custom bureaucracy. And uh, so many paperwork, again, so many applications. So uh, now this is also very easy. Three years ago, would I think that these changes would happen? I wouldn't believe it. So thinking about the future of Uzbekistan, what do you see as the challenges and the issues that need to be addressed? I would say like uh, one ongoing reform, which uh, everybody aware is the tax reform. And, uh, and that tax reform, I, I think that um, it started very well. And um, it is good that we uh, moved from uh, uh, old uh, turnover tax into a new tax system where it is a value-added tax uh, um, is now sort of prevailing tax. Uh, before, only uh, less than 3% of entities used to pay VAT, the rest was on a turnover tax. And the turnover tax actually wasn't allowing uh, companies uh, 
to create uh, value chain, uh, long value chains, because every time when it uh, was taxed on turnover, it was making a product more expensive, and therefore those chains were usually short, and the product they were bringing to the market would be very simple, like just bring raw material, pr reproduce it, and then uh, pack it or something and sell it. And so that was sort of uh, keeping back all production services, everything. But uh, I think that um, it was also one of these very brave and uh, bold reforms. And that is actually proves the uh, political will of the government take hard decisions. And uh, recently, you know, the, uh, that reform was extended into um, uh, agricultural sector. And uh, I think that there is uh, uh, generally, because we uh, transact a lot with agricultural sector, uh, there are some reforms uh, to be conducted in agricultural sectors, uh, like, you know, the, the real, like, you know, I, I, I think that we should really move to a bigger farms, bigger produ production units for uh, dairy, uh, meat, vegetable, and, uh, and uh, that would probably take some reform steps uh, ahead. I would actually think that eventually we will come to uh, ownership of agricultural lands as well, where the farmers and uh, big companies, farming companies, have would have some security and long-term uh, plans. Uh, I think that at some stage we should come to that. There has been a tremendous change in uh, uh, which I think that uh, I think a revolutionary change in uh, taxing uh, personal income, uh, which was like you know the personal income tax were so high, it was actually holding back creation. Uh, of uh, new workplaces. And uh, more than that, it, it was so big that a lot of businesses were hiding their workforce from the government because, uh, uh, like, you know, salary tax was so huge, both on uh, entity and on uh, uh, employee. So uh, now I'll tell you, it's uh, uh, like recent figures, you know, like, uh, 571,000 in, in, in a, in a six-month, yeah. you know, and uh, it is not only the number, it's also the, uh, uh, the size of the salary has grown. Yeah, yeah and uh, also what I would um, say that uh, uh, one of the changes uh, is taking place, and uh, one of this I'm uh, very actively advocating, is that uh, service and trade uh, is the same uh, source of a value creation as a production, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I was recently looking at statistics that 48% uh, jobs in Uzbekistan comes in the service and trade, and uh, really I'm uh, be being retailer myself and uh, and uh, also wholesaler, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, somewhat, we, we are now employing five and a half thousand wow. people, yeah. and uh, yes, it's sizable, but uh, we could do more and uh, we're doing more. So what I'm trying to say, like, you know, and uh, this is also, I think, reforms uh, where uh, service economy and trade uh, also uh, is going to be looked at as uh, maybe as mature and uh, uh, powerful uh, source of economic growth as agriculture or production. Rahmat Akan. Qatar Rahmat. Salaamu Alaikum. Hi, Ed. The textile industry is an incredible one for Uzbekistan. Cotton is at the heart of the culture. It's the national emblem. It's in so many parts of society. You see it everywhere. And, you know, the transformation of the agriculture sector is going to underpin a big part of Uzbekistan's future. A country that used to primarily export raw commodity cotton, uh, trying to really, really boost its textile industry. Uh, one that apparently has quite a bit of potential. And so we thought we'd go and speak with uh, uh, somebody who's at the heart of this industry, Narmeen Akramova. Narmeen's story is great. At 18, she started a cosmetics uh, company importing cosmetics to be sold in a heavily regulated economy, built up enough capital to then start up a big textile uh, company that now exports quite a lot of uh, finished textiles to the Russian market. And so we, we went to talk to Narmeen. You're at the front line of the economic reforms, uh, textiles, cotton industry, exports. The, these are the biggest issues that the economic reforms that started in 2017 have looked at. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about 
uh, uh, take us on a little bit of a journey between what life used to be like for you as an exporter, say in 2015 or 2016, and what is it like for you today? Uh, what is the big difference? What are the major changes? And, and what is working for you? Я могу для себя лично, для нашей компании, отметить, в первую очередь, это открытие конвертаций. Это очень сильно облегчило работу экспортеров, особенно в нашей отрасли. До этого момента, до момента открытия конвертации, сложности были в чем? Ту валюту, которую мы элементарно получали по контракту, мы ее просто не могли использовать, кроме как обязательной продажи в банке. Но в этом году, вернее, в 2018 году, в конце 2018 года мы решили проверить накопленные средства, поступление от наших инспекционных работ. Мы пустили частично в производственный процесс. Вот мы приобрели там в Китае, мы приобрели принтер, digital принтер для тканей. Удивило, что в первую очередь удивило сам процесс прохождения, сама процедура. Если раньше это было что-то такое невообразимо сложное, то сейчас нам понадобилось буквально три дня для того, чтобы заключить контракт с китайской компанией и а, привезти сюда, соответственно, оборудование. Ну вот это элементарный пример, такой как бы кейс из а, жизни, из нашей. Thanks. So obviously one of the sectors that's changed quite a lot uh, as well as a result of the reforms or is in the process of changing is the agriculture sector. Uh, it's at the forefront of the reforms given the, the large numbers of people that live in rural areas. Uh, you know, Uzbekistan has a long history of, of being a cotton producer and a wheat producer. Um, and many of the changes that are happening at the moment are affecting the agriculture sector. Um, how are these reforms in the agriculture sector affecting your work? Uh, and, and I understand, obviously, that not everything has been done yet, and you know, there may still be some problems along the way. Maybe you could also talk to us a little bit about that and, and how it affects your textile industry. One of the most important industries in our economy, unfortunately, we have to admit, is the agricultural sector. Why did it become important? Because it had to be changed in it for a long time, first of all, from irrigation. It's all connected to the production of chlapchatnik, that is, its arrangement. К сожалению, именно для него, так как хлопчатник потребляет очень много воды, у нас ее нет. И то, что сейчас была принята программа по сокращению посевных, может быть, это даже неплохо. И то, что в перспективе, насколько я знаю, принята также программа сокращения продажи хлопка сырца на внешний рынок, для того, чтобы перерабатывать его, дать возможность своим собственным предприятиям перерабатывать его в готовый продукт, это тоже колоссальный плюс. В нашем секторе на самом деле еще очень много, очень, очень, очень много проблем. Но радует другое то, что у нас в республике создаются кластеры. Кластер в своем идеале это не самая худшая вещь в экономике, а можно сказать, что это, это высшая ступень развития для производственника. Когда ты имеешь собственные земли, когда ты выращиваешь на нем продукт и закрываешь его до конечной продукции и доводишь его до потребителя, имея свои торговые дома, точки и так далее. What are the three biggest actions that the government could take uh, to, in continuance of the reforms, that would help your business? Одну из самых главных проблем для нас и главных э, секторов, которые должны будут развиваться, это инвестиции, вхождение иностранных инвестиций и доступность наших. Это недорогие деньги, в первую очередь, потому что нужно снизить ставку по кредитам, нужно дать предпринимателям возможность их более легкого получения. У нас все-таки большая доля бюрократии здесь присутствует. You know, there are a lot of barriers to entry in Uzbekistan for women, cultural barriers, um, you know, regulatory barriers in some instances, barriers to education. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what it, what it is like to actually run a business as a woman, the barriers that you face, and, and what is your approach to dealing with them? До сих пор мы испытываем на себе тяготы гендерного неравенства, когда к женщинам не очень серьезно относятся при переговорах. Ну и мы в нашей компании практикуем такое, что на переговоры, например, наши, от лица моей компании идет топ-менеджер. И топ-менеджер – мужчина. Соответственно, для того, чтобы у вас были гарантии успеха и гарантия взятия контракта, я уже проверяла несколько раз, лучше, наверное, послать мужчину. Мы преодолеваем барьеры, мы двигаемся дальше. У нас нет выбора. So, I mean, obviously, one of the concerns in Uzbekistan uh, at the macroeconomic level is the slowdown in the Russian economy. Uh, and I know that Russia is a very large export market for you. 
Um, you know, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts around uh, how how your business is going to cope with uh, with with the slowdown in Russia? And what are your thoughts around your strategy for your business? Ну, Россия для нас стратегический партнер, конечно, для Узбекистана, потому что настолько массовый рынок вряд ли кто-то заменит. Но тем не менее мы не опускаем голову, несмотря на все трудности, которые там сейчас происходят. Несмотря на то, что заказы, которые поступают от России, сейчас из России, они э, очень сильно снизились в числовом эквиваленте, ну и в ценовом тоже. Пока-пока ближайшая стратегия наша, ближайшая, это рынки, которые находятся недалеко от нас, наши соседи. Казахстан, Киргизия, Украина, э, Грузия, Азербайджан. Это все рынок сбыта для Узбекистана и для нашего текстиля. And what about your business in general? Uh, what are your thoughts about the next 15 years? So you've had textile control for 15 years now. Uh, what about the next 15 years? What is the future for you? Ну, планы в развитии нашей компании однозначно есть. Мы растем, мы наращиваем производственные мощности. Иногда бывают периоды стагнации, иногда бывает так, что приходится распускать рабочих. Иногда бывает так, что наоборот не хватает рабочих рук и приходится давать, даже на давальческое отдавать сырье для выполнения заказов. В любом случае, мы никогда не унываем. Мы рады всем тем реформам, которые сейчас здесь проходят. Я надеюсь, что эти реформы не остановятся. It's easy to think about Uzbekistan's changes as just about economic reforms, about foreign exchange, about liberalization. But one of the nicest things about the changes over the last two years has been the immense social change that has happened in, 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 since 2017. Uh, we're here today at the Ilhom Theater, which was uh, the Soviet Union's first independent theater set up in 1976. Uh, and we're here to talk to Nikita Makarenka. Nikita is a blogger, a journalist, a theater producer, and a musician, uh, and a certifiable ball guy from Tashkent. Uh, and we thought we'd use uh, all of those many talents to talk about the process of social change in Uzbekistan and how these social changes are actually interacting with the process of economic reform uh, to get a sense of how uh, times are changing. What do you think are the most important uh, markers of change, say, two years ago when many of the big reforms started, the economic reforms, but really the profound social reforms as well, and now? For me, as a journalist, uh, the most important sign is that I can write. And you know about changes, about reforms, because you have an opportunity to read my stories. It was not possible at all during a dream of times, during, as we say, previous times. Uh, I came back into profession on 2017, when I have realized that it is possible to try to write something. We didn't know, but we tried, and it worked. Uh, previously, in Karim of Times, I even did not try, because I knew that it will lead to very bad consequences. But I tried in 2017, in May, and it was a huge blast, and people have been writing messages, hundreds of messages to me. We can't believe that journalism is back to Uzbekistan. And for me, that was the most important sign. For sure, after this, we felt a lot of changes and probably one of the most important is liberalization in economy, which we've been waiting for a long time. Now you could easily go to any exchange office and change your money. There is no black market anymore. Uh, a lot of positive signs with police, with uh, overall pressure which uh, the government have been pressing citizens for a long time. Now you can see people are not afraid of police anymore. They walk on the streets at evening and city is vibrant again. So all of these changes are going on and you can see results of it. For sure it's just the first steps and we need to do more and to continue. And what do you think in terms of people on the street? Uh, you know, when, when it comes to their lives, uh, you know, uh, I remember reading an article of yours uh, that you wrote kind of at the end of 2018, taking stock of the reforms uh -huh. of the year. It showed, a, it showed an interesting curvature of uh, positive and, and ups and downs in the reform, uh, in the reform journey. Uh, and your kind of verdict was uh, a great start to the year and then a little bit of uh, a downturn on the reforms. Uh, we're now six months into 2019, and uh, what do you think? How do you, how do you feel about the situation at the moment? Okay, at the moment I feel the situation is chaotic. 
I really, really desperate to see a strong strategy. But you could see that the government or the president issue a bill or a law, and then after a month they change it. It's a chaos and it affects people because they don't feel stable. I really, really want to see some strong strategy to implement reforms. What do you think about, you know, one of the biggest challenges for Uzbekistan in, in this transition uh, has been also kind of dealing with international perceptions around forced labor, tackling forced labor issues, um, tackling, you know, that, and, and in, which has been an integral part of that social change process uh, uh, as well. And, you know, things, there have been radical changes in that front and things have moved, you know, a significant amount. Um, when you interact with people around the world, uh, when you when you go about doing your work as a journalist in Uzbekistan, how do you see those types of social issues and, and the change in those issues? Do you, do you see real progress? You know, are you are you optimistic about you know uh, a changing international perception of Uzbekistan when it comes to forced labor, for example? I'm carefully optimistic. For sure, you could see that we have a significant process in forced labor, and I definitely know that people on the top, the real decision makers, they really want to get rid of it. It is awful. Definitely, there is no discussion about that. It's clear, it is awful and we have to get rid of it. But it's so complicated because people who work on the middle level of the management, like deputy of Hakim of regions, that's people, they are so old fashioned in their minds. There is just not enough competent people to replace all of them. It is a very, very long process which is tightly connected to education. And I think we have to wait until the younger generation will take power into their hands. From being a country where the citizens, you know, really didn't have the kind of voice that they do today, uh, you know, citizen engagement has been a huge priority for the president, for the yeah. government. Um, you have the online receptions. You have uh, the president relentlessly traveling, you know, to all of the provinces every month. Uh, you know, they're in a new province to try and engage with citizenry. Um, and, and for a country that wasn't used to doing this, it's um, impressive to see kind of very quickly how, how they're trying to get it right. Uh, but do you see, you know, what are your thoughts on citizen engagement in Uzbekistan? Oh, sure. uh, so citizen engagement is the hot and painful topic. Uh, you're very right about freedom of speech and people, when they see that we speak, they start to speak. This is super cool. They do their posts in a Facebook. They are not afraid to speak. They are not afraid to interact uh, with authorities. But there is a huge problem uh, on the way of this progress. For 70 years under the Soviet Union and for 26 years under the Karimov um, government, people had no right to do anything and to influence anything. So they get used to it. They just get used that somebody make a decision about everything. They, wasn't, they weren't engaged in anything for a very long time. And right now we're facing the situation that Nobody wants to be responsible for their lives. People just do not want to take responsibility. If they have a problem, they could speak about the problem, but then they're waiting that authority will come and fix it. They do not want to fix it by themselves. How do you make change happen? How do you change that? What can the government do? What, what can people like you and your community of practitioners of journalism, what can you do to change that? It's a very, very complicated way to educate people and to explain that politics is not a sacred thing. It's not a, a people who blessed by the God or someone else do it. Politics is you. It's about you. It's about your neighborhood. It's about your city. What are the three things that you're most optimistic about? What, what are the three things that you're really looking forward to? Okay, I'm really optimistic about our relations with the rest of the world. And it's true that we are opening to the world and you could see that now we are visa free to almost all the world and this is the very good sign because in Karim of times we couldn't travel even to Tajikistan. We need to have a visa and I'm very optimistic about external policy and I think we're doing good. And I'm really optimistic about freedom of the speech. 
I know that the new head of uh, agency of press and information have a goal to make Uzbekistan, in terms of freedom of the speech, more free than other post-Soviet countries. And I think this is a very nice goal, and if we will achieve it, that will be a very great sign of uh, reformation. Definitely, we can't beat corruption and we can't uh, do reforms without support of a free media. Free media is a crucial for this process because you can't have a free society without a free media. And I'm really happy that Uzbekistan is going well in this field. It's not ideal for now. Journalists, they still got threats. There is a still a lot of problem with self-censorship, a lot of problem with censorship in a official media which is sponsored by the government. But just imagine that the government uh, put a lot, a lot of uh, attention to the media and you could see that they established a new agency of press and information which loudly said that they will protect us from anything. This is the sign from the government from the very top that they consider us a crucial thing for a reformation process. Um, I mean, it is a very cool, uh, and is that translating on the ground? Do you have, I mean, do you feel like those commitments are actually uh, translating? Do you, I mean, for example, even in the last year, do you think that things are even better or, you know, when it, when it comes to your ability to tell the story? Yes, it's, I think that uh, things are getting better. Definitely, it is not ideal for now. It is not ideal for sure. But things are getting better. And in terms of work of the governmental uh, organizations and offices with journalists, it improved a lot. Now, I think everybody in the country feel that they need to communicate and collaborate with us. Previously, it's been like, is it a journalist? Please call the guards, he shouldn't be here. Now, are you a journalist? We welcome you. Do you need information? Please take. It's completely different attitude, and now they feel that they need us, and we need them. This is a great collaboration. We really hope you enjoyed watching that video as much as we did making it for you. Now, let's go across and listen to some voices from across the region. One of the biggest development challenges in the Western Balkans is that only four out of 10 people of working age are employed. For the Western Balkans to move from being middle-income countries to countries that have vibrant middle classes, more people need good jobs. World Bank's support to address the jobs challenge is different in each country, but it centers around understanding and addressing what holds back firms and people. For firms, some of the issues might be good transportation, reliable energy, or access to finance. But it's also about leveling the playing field so that the most productive firms can compete, grow, and generate jobs. For people, education systems, starting with early childhood through to tertiary education, need to provide people with the skills to enter the labor market. In the short term, governments can partner with the private sector on mechanisms that can help smooth the school-to-work transition. One of the biggest opportunities for the Western Balkans is to continue to strengthen regional cooperation. Strong regional cooperation can bring benefits in many areas, from improving the performance of transport corridors or the affordability of energy, to generating the economies of scale that are needed to attract more investments. In the European Union countries, which are overall uh, really converging towards Western Europe, the biggest challenge is that not every part of the population is actually prospering. There are big lagging regions, for example in uh, Romania, mm -hmm. while Bucharest is becoming quickly as rich as Paris, if you go even a hundred kilometers away, you will find people living in absolute grinding poverty. We are focusing our programs specifically on the lagging regions in order to improve their capacity, their institutional structures, and making sure that these regions have the education, the health services, 
and the administrative capacity to move together. For example, we are going to do a big health project in Romania that will get insurance to the uninsured, especially in rural areas. In eastern Croatia, we are working on a comprehensive development plan that takes this lagging region much closer to European averages. The biggest opportunity for our countries is really in making sure that every single person have the basic level of human capital of the basic education, of basic health services, and access to jobs and markets. And that is really what our program here is concentrating on doing. The main challenge that I see is still one of poverty. In fact, as an example, in Georgia today, we still have 20% of the people that live in poverty, and we have similar numbers in Armenia. I think there are three underlying root causes around which we need to center our responses. Number one, human capital, in particular on health and education. Number two, resilience um, at the macro-financial level, individual level, and environmental level. And number three, competitiveness. We need to get back to a sustainable private sector-led growth model that focuses on country outcomes. So we have an exciting program centered on innovation in all three countries. In Armenia, we are currently supporting young entrepreneurs in the ICT in the tech sector. In Azerbaijan, we have an exciting program on e-court reform as part of an overall justice system reform program. And in Georgia, we are working with the government on e-procurement reforms as well as um, blockchain for land registration. So in terms of opportunity, um, I don't believe that there are any silver bullets. And I do believe that we need to continue to build on the foundations of reforms, having good governance practices, um, having a good macro environment, um, and moving away from the hard to the soft reforms. Now, while I don't believe in silver bullets, I do believe in golden opportunities, and I see two in the region. Number one, around the innovation agenda, and number two, around connectivity, both globally, regionally, and within the countries, between the rural areas and the urban cities. Central Asia is a fascinating region that once during the ancient Silk Road times was a flourishing region. The biggest challenge of today's Central Asia is to reinvigorate high sustainable private sector-led growth that creates well-paying jobs. Another aspect of the challenge is its integration into the global economy, as well as with its neighbors and internally. And finally, and probably most critical, is the need for better governance for more effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions. The bank has a large program in Central Asia, in the top five in the bank. We support the region in strengthening the foundations for inclusive private sector-led growth, enhancing connectivity, and boosting productivity. We're also focusing on building resilience through investments in human capital and adapting better to environmental and climate risks. The most exciting development in the region is opening up in Uzbekistan, and the bank is supporting it at this critical juncture with advice on its transition to a market economy. Central Asia is surrounded by China, South Asia, and Russia, all vibrant and growing markets. And this positions the region to become a trade and transit hub for the emerging Eurasian continent. The bank is supporting the region to seize this opportunity through improving infrastructure, connectivity, and trade facilitation so that Central Asia can become a true center of Asia. After nearly two decades of remarkable economic growth, the Turkish economy entered a phase of sharp economic contraction in the summer of 2018. And the economy is still in the doldrums, with growth forecast to be in negative territories in 2019. The challenge, therefore, is coming out of the trough in the short term and resuming growth in the medium term for Turkey to make progress toward high income status. We maintained a strong engagement in Turkey over the past year, thus contributing to the counter-cyclical response to the crisis. We were able to finance important infrastructure in schools and cities. We financed activities to boost livelihood and employment opportunities for refugees and the host communities. We supported reforms to boost the functioning of capital market and financial inclusion. Turkey has many strengths, but let me mention just three. First, Turkey boasts a strong human capital potential. Its population is young. 25% of the population is below age 15. Therefore, Turkey has a chance 
to grow rich before growing old. Second, Turkey boasts a dynamic private sector, a booming middle class, and a well-developed banking sector. The three together can be a powerful source of growth. Third and finally, Turkey boasts an excellent geographic location. It can therefore easily integrate global value chains. Russia has maintained strong macroeconomic stability. Now the challenge is to accelerate economic growth and reduce poverty. We have uh, uh, carried out some important analytical work to identify ways to increase Russia's growth potential. Uh, this requires more investment in human capital and infrastructure, uh, also investments in the private sector more broadly, but more importantly, it requires increased productivity. We also uh, looked at ways to reduce poverty, to have poverty to 6.6% by 2024, which is the government's objective. And that would require additional fiscal resources of about 0.4% of GDP to be allocated to social assistance programs. And if these resources are well targeted, this goal is achievable. Russia has a very strong human capital base. The country is among the top 10 countries in the world in terms of harmonized learning outcomes. But that's not enough to increase productivity growth. What is needed is increased competition that would allow uh, resources to go to more productive companies, to more productive sectors, that would also force enterprises to innovate and would facilitate the exit of less productive companies and the entry of more productive companies into the market. So strengthening competition would go a long way to increase economic growth and also improve the well-being of Russian citizens. These are times of major political change in Ukraine and Moldova, and with those changes come opportunities. In Ukraine, an anti-establishment candidate won presidential elections in April, and he ran on a ticket of anti-corruption and promised uh, to promote measures to increase living standards of people, and he won by a landslide. At the same time in Moldova, uh, in late June, the power also changed hands. The oligarch who ruled the country for many years was, uh, was ousted from power to the surprise of many. And like in Ukraine, the new leadership in Moldova has committed to fight the wide, widespread corruption and also promote demonopolization and de-oligarchization. The biggest challenge in both of these countries, Ukraine and Moldova, is now to promote and accelerate productivity growth and economic growth. And this is needed to raise living standards and to prevent these countries falling into a low-income uh, growth trap. Improving governance and promoting competition is a partial answer to that challenge, but it's not the complete answer. The broader answer lies to the supporting the completion of the transition from a command to a fully functioning market economy. For example, in Ukraine, that requires opening of the agricultural land market uh, so that Ukraine can finally reach uh, its full agricultural potential. And in Moldova, among other, thing, other things, it means the privatization of state-owned enterprises. And these are just a few examples. Good morning, and thank you for joining us here in Washington. We are live at the World Bank headquarters. Um, we have heard from our colleagues from across the region, Europe and Central Asia, and we had a deep dive into Uzbekistan, one of the fastest growing and fastest reforming economies in our region. I am very, very pleased to be joined by a distinguished panel this morning. Uh, we have economists from across the region. Ashley demirguch kont um, our chief economist for Europe and Central Asia. Apurva Sangi, lead economist for Russia, and Farouk Khan, lead economist for Ukraine. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Colleagues, we would like to talk a little bit about uh, what is happening in our region. Asli, if I may please start with you, um, what is the macroeconomic overview of our region? What is happening? What are the trends? And how is it affecting countries? 
Thank you, Sana. As you know, uh, real GDP growth has been down in the region. Uh, we are forecasting it in 2019 to be 2.6%. This is 0.3 percentage points lower than what we were forecasting in the beginning of the year. Um, and this reflects a slower trade, a slower, a lower uh, investment, and also in general, lower confidence. Um, now, unfortunately, going forward, the risks are also on the downside. Uh, we are worried about escalating trade tensions, potential uh, financial market turmoil in some countries, and also the potential for lower than expected performance in major economies. Now, when um, global growth is looking down, um, this also has implications for our region, despite the fact that our region is quite diverse. For um, the um, developing and emerging markets of our region, uh, we are forecasting in 2019 uh, growth of 1.6%. Uh, now, this is quite lower than what we achieved last year. Uh, it was a little over 3%, and it is a four-year uh, low. And compared to the beginning of the year, it's 0.7 percentage points lower. Uh -huh. So um, this reflects um, worse than performance that uh, Turkey showed, unfortunately. And what's happening in the region is that uh, goods trade is low, mm -hmm. uh, euro area is sluggish, uh, monetary tightening has stopped, uh, fiscal policy is loosening, uh, inflation is on the rise in uh, major economies, Poland, Russia, Turkey, partly because of the rising oil prices. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is uh, we expect a recovery in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully with the recovery uh, in Turkey. Now, this is going to be 2.7% uh, uh, is the expectation. Um, again, this is subject to a number of down risks. Um, chief among them is the performance in the euro area, which is a destination for our exports. Uh, if Russia doesn't do as well as expected, this is going to have implications for remittances right. uh, affecting uh, Central Asia and Eastern European countries. Uh, in some countries in the region, um, there is significant private sector debt, mm -hmm. um, and particularly uh, Turkey, for example, causing um, you know, problems for uh, public sector uh, contingent liabilities. Uh, reliance on foreign flows, um, foreign denominated debt could lead to financial market turmoil. And of course, uh, there's always the risk of policy uncertainty and potential for, um, you know, uh, slowing down of structural reforms. We are aware of these risks, right. but we are still hoping by 2020 we are going to be seeing a recovery. Thank you, Asli. It's good to that we are expecting positive developments in 2020. Apurva, I may turn to you now. Russia is um, a large economy, uh, one of the largest countries in the world. What is the macroeconomic outlook in Russia? What is happening there? Can you tell us a little bit? Sure, Sona. So, you know, there's this uh, Russian economist who was once asked to describe the economy in one word. Uh -huh. And she says, uh, good. When asked to elaborate, she says, not good. So today, the good part is that after having emerged from a recent recession, Russia's growth is once again in positive territory. The not good part is that in the years ahead, we forecast only modest growth mm -hmm. between 1.2 and 1.8 percent, well below the global growth average and the ECA regional average of about 2.6 percent that uh, Asla had, had said. Now, Russia's growth builds on a bedrock of macro fiscal stability. Right. So on the, on the monetary front, inflation around 4% is the lowest it's ever been. In fact, had inflation trends of 2015 sustained, a bowl of borscht soup, which is a pretty much Russia's national dish, would have been 31 rubles instead of 18 rubles today. So inflation is under control. Uh, on the external front, buffers are strong. So at 27%, Russia's external debt to GDP ratio is the third lowest among emerging markets. Compare that to 120% for the Eurozone. And with over half a trillion dollars, Russia has the world's fifth highest levels of international reserves. Right. On the fiscal front, Russia can boast fiscal surpluses across all three tiers of government. 
general, federal, and regional. It has a new and revamped fiscal rule which seeks to end this addiction to oil. And for non-economists watching us today, what a fiscal rule does is basically if oil prices are above a certain threshold, then the rule commits to saving these additional revenues for future generations. And in doing so, it protects your economy today from the ups and downs of volatile oil prices. But in all of this, uh, luck has also played a role. Don't we underestimate the importance of luck? It's oh, funny. absolutely. No, in fact, uh, there's, this, there's this funny story about this very talented general who was uh, once taken to Napoleon. Mm. And Napoleon takes one look at him and says, I don't care if you're talented, are you lucky? Right. So <laughs> luck, plays, um, luck plays a role. And in the case of Russia, there's been the good luck of firming oil prices, a recovering global economy, and good climate, which has led Russia to become the world's topmost producer and exporter of wheat. But there are pressing issues on all these three fronts. So on the monetary front, you know, what matters to a central banker is not so much inflation once it's realized, but inflationary expectations. Mm -hmm. And expectations remain high and still need to be anchored. The banking system is heavily state-dominated. State-owned banks account for over 60% of all assets. Oh, wow. It's also heavily concentrated. So the top five banks generate a whopping 57% of all profits. And the bailouts to the banking system so far have cost 50 billion US dollars. And that's the cost of almost four Olympic Games. Wow. On the external front, FDI, foreign direct investment in Russia, uh, how shall I say, is uh, neither very foreign <laughs> nor very direct. <laughs> and that's because inward FDI mm -hmm. in Russia is either Russian investments masquerading as foreign ones or are simply reinvestments. Mm -hmm. In fact, genuine FDI, once you take reinvestments out of the equation for the last three years, according to some estimates, was just 0.2% of GDP. Almost non-existent then. Yeah, even lower than Venezuela's. Right. Wow. And finally, on the fiscal front, Russia's fiscal rule is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. So to entrench its credibility, Russia must avoid what I call the honeypot syndrome. It must resist the temptation to use to spend these growing oil windfalls domestically. Right. Because spending these, uh, these windfalls would not only reduce the amounts available for future generations and make the economy once again mm -hmm. more vulnerable to oil prices, but it would also reduce the pressure to undertake deeper structural reforms. So, Sona, the big question today really is how does Russia move from this stability to growth? Apurva, we'll come back to that. Thank you for raising that, but we we'll definitely come back to Russia. But um, now I want to move on to uh, Russia's neighbor, Ukraine. And we have Farouk Khan, who joined us here from Kiev. Farouk, um, the last five years, Ukraine has been on this uh, bust and boom cycle um, nonstop, and there have been a lot of reforms that have taken place. Can you tell us how is Ukraine of today different from Ukraine five years ago? What is the outlook? What is going on? Yeah, thank you, Sona. Uh, Ukraine has a history of macroeconomic boom and bust cycles. If you look back to the last 10 years, Ukraine has experienced two deep economic crises. Mm -hmm. First, in 2009, after the global financial crisis, when the economy contracted by 14.8%. Uh -huh. And second, in 2014 and 2015, in the aftermath of the Donbas conflict and the global financial crisis, when the economy contracted by a cumulative 16%. Mm -hmm. In both of these instances, while it was an external shock that pushed the economy over the cliff, the underlying cause was really deep structural bottlenecks and weaknesses in the economy. Let me point to three big problems. Um, the first problem was in the banking sector. Uh, the banking sector was very weakly regulated. Mm -hmm. Essentially, many banks were in the business of taking deposits from the population and shipping those assets overseas. Mm -hmm. um, the second big problem was in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. The energy sector had a big gap between the cost of energy for the country and the price at which energy was being sold in the domestic market, as a result of which there was a big hole in Ukraine's public finances. The third big problem was the pension system, which was in complete disarray. 
with very weak link between pension contributions and the pension benefits that people were actually getting. As a result, very few people were participating in the system and Ukraine's public finances also had to fill the, uh, fill the hole. Over the last five years, Ukraine has done more to address these structural mm -hmm. uh, sources of Ukraine's macroeconomic boom and bust cycles than it had done in the previous 20 years. Wow. Many of the reforms uh, over the last five years have helped address the problems that I just mentioned. For example, the banking sector, the supervision in the banking sector was significantly uh, strengthened. More than 90 banks out of 180 banks were closed down. Wow, that's a, that's a large number. Absolutely. <laughs> Most of the banks then. Yes, exactly. Um, second, in the energy sector, the energy tariff reform essentially helped close a massive quasi-fiscal deficit, which at its peak was 5% of GDP. Third, the pension reform helped strengthen the links between pension contributions and pension um, benefits, as a result of which pension expenditures were stabilized at 10% of GDP, rather than rising to a no reform scenario of 14% of GDP. As a result of all of these reforms, the Ukraine of today is very different from the Ukraine of five years ago. The fiscal deficit has been maintained at uh, under 2.3% mm -hmm. of GDP, four years in a row. Uh, and the problem of widespread related party lending in the banking sector has essentially been reined in. Um, but the Ukrainian authorities need to be vigilant because there are significant macroeconomic vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And these vulnerabilities come from Ukraine's very large financing needs, mm -hmm. and they come from fiscal vulnerabilities that could emerge if Ukraine submitted to populist pressures. For example, the authorities will need to do three big things in order to keep the macroeconomic stability on track. The first is not to tinker with the newly established pension indexation yeah. system. The second is that Ukraine needs to resist the urge to increase public sector wages in an ad hoc fashion. Right. Any increases in public sector wages need to be coordinated with the consolidation of the oversized mm -hmm. school and hospital network. And third, Ukraine needs to make sure that the supervision of the banking sector remains strong. But perhaps what is most important is Ukraine needs to now turn its attention to boosting economic growth, yeah. because it is that that will make sure that the Ukraine of the future is very different from the Ukraine of the past. And that's, that's a great message to um, conclude that. And I want to come back, we want to come back to the challenges. Um, so stay tuned on that. But I want to go back now to Asli and uh, talk about Turkey. Turkey is another very large economy in our region that drives the growth. And we want to understand what is happening in Turkey. There have been some significant achievements in the last decade. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you heard the country director speak earlier. Uh, Turkey has been having a tough time lately, mm -hmm. but we need to put that in the context of the development achievements. Over the last two decades, actually, Turkey has done incredibly well. Mm -hmm. um, Turks have managed to increase their real GDP per capita three times oh, wow. um, and almost becoming a high income mm -hmm. country. Uh, in, at the same time, uh, poverty uh, was significantly reduced mm -hmm. and all this without significantly increasing uh, income inequality. Right. Uh, for the most part, uh, the reduction in poverty was due to increases in labor income. Mm -hmm. So people had access to more jobs and better paying jobs. Mm -hmm. So these are significant achievements by any standards. And uh, they were uh, mostly achieved due to significant structural um, reforms. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, these reforms were started after the 2001 uh, macrofinancial crisis that Turkey has suffered. Uh, there was significant amount of uh, restructuring in the banking sector. Uh, banks were recapitalized, uh, they were consolidated. When was that? Um, this was right after the 2001. Mm -hmm. um, um, then uh, there was reforms in uh, institutions. Uh, there were uh, independent um, regulator, uh, independent central bank. Um, there was um, reduction in uh, fiscal deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, they've expanded the tax base. There was privatization of the state enterprises right. and some banks. Um, so uh, also um, with the um, 
accession uh, to, mm -hmm. um, to EU talks starting in 2005 and uh, uh, stabilization program of the uh, fund. Uh, there were significant uh, governance reforms in the um, in the government, um, and all these actually led to a reduction of the role of the government in the economy, and a, a much larger and uh, private sector uh, growth of the private sector and improvement in uh, public sector delivery. So uh, these were all good. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the um, the performance started faltering a bit in the second half of this period. Right. Turkey has been subject to, to significant shocks after the global financial crisis of 2008. Um, a, as a result, um, you know, there was um, there was a sort of a, a also a reduction in uh, productivity associated with somewhat slowing down of the reforms, right. misallocation of resources, mm -hmm. erosion of institutions. And um, despite these, uh, for <coughs> till <coughs> 2018, um, Turkey, sorry, managed to <coughs> get over, uh, managed to um, avoid the recession, mm -hmm. and um, and they uh, had effective counter cyclical policies. Mm -hmm. But um, in the second half of 2018, um, there was a recession, and this was triggered by the fragility of the uh, corporate debt, high corporate debt denominated. So this was mid 2018. Yes. And uh, there was market turmoil, um, a, a financial outflows, um, a depreciation of the lira, uh, investment declined, and so did uh, consumption. So um, now, again, the good news is mm -hmm. we are hoping in um, 2020, <coughs> Turkey will recover. <coughs> I'm sorry. And, uh, <coughs> and um, this is, uh, of course, um, on the back of improving demand mm -hmm. and improving uh, net exports, uh, provided that uh, uh, fiscal and monetary policy managed to keep the exchange rate stable and there is um, restructuring in the corporate sector that uh, prevents any damage to the uh, financial sector health. Great. Uh, well, this was very helpful. Um, we have now heard about three major countries in our region. What I want to talk about a little bit is what are the long-term development challenges? And I'm going to go around and ask um, everyone <coughs> to describe the challenges in their respective countries. But Asli, I want to start with you. If you can give us the overall context of long-term challenges for our region, where do you see those? Yes, there are quite a few important challenges and they're uh, complex. So I want to sort of classify them into four mm -hmm. and then talk about them in turn. So uh, one of the chief challenges is to improve governance. Uh -huh. uh, second one is to complete the transition to inclusive and competitive markets. Uh -huh. Third one is to strengthen the environment uh, for private sector investment and innovation. And fourth uh, is a very important one, climate change. So um, <clears throat> let me start with the governance. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know, I mean, I think there's uh, full agreement by, uh, by governments and individuals around the world that good governance is very important for achieving good development outcomes. And this also emphasizes the importance of institutions mm -hmm. building uh, inclusive, effective, transparent institutions mm -hmm. that brings the citizens into the picture and makes them part of the solution. Citizen so that engagement, would you exactly, say that's what it is? Exactly. So that citizens uh, are able to demand the right policies from their policymakers mm -hmm. who are accountable to these needs. And how do we do that? Uh, it's very important to give citizens uh, timely information, uh, knowledge, analysis, so that they can demand the right policies. And this is a way of ensuring that uh, there is strong social contract right. in the economy so that, you know, the glue that holds it together mm -hmm. and allows everyone together to achieve and the right And trust, I believe, right? Exactly. So uh, that's one very important thing. And we've had a uh, conference in Ankara uh, in June where we've discussed different dimensions of this. And there's going to be much more work in this area that we're working on. Now, the second um, <coughs> important um, set of challenges is 
<coughs> the, I'm so sorry, is the, um, the move towards a uh, markets, uh, market economies. Mm -hmm. And um, different countries in the region are at different stages of this development. And uh, one of the big challenges is um, how to boost productivity and how to boost innovation and uh, investment. Mm -hmm. And this is the big challenge because over the last decade, it's been going down right. across the, the board in the region, despite increasing levels of debt, particularly private debt. Yeah. And one of the sort of um, challenges that uh, actually is part of this is the demographic changes mm -hmm. that are uh, happening in the region. You know, the region. What are is, those? What um, you know, the happening? region is aging, so there is declining uh, mortality and for fertility mm -hmm. in most of the region. Uh, after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, there has been migration mm -hmm. to to Russia as well as uh, Europe. Um, you know, Turkey and Central Asia uh, are actually in the beginning of these right. demographic changes. But regardless, this is very important. In order to offset the effect of this, it's very important to bring women into uh, the uh, labor force and uh, make them part of the economic opportunities. And, uh, you know, retaining and attracting labor is also important, and that is uh, that's associated with immigration policies. Uh, a very important aspect of this is also investing in human capital, both health and education, so that we can uh, make the most of technological mm -hmm. advances, uh, attract FDI, and also uh, retain skilled labor. Right. Now, very associated with this is to sort of provide the business environment for uh, sort of uh, private sector. As you know, um, we. Uh, from all across the globe, we have experience that suggests that uh, public sector tends to be less productive than the private sector. So across the region, a privatization holds promise, particularly if it is coupled mm -hmm. with uh, improvements in the business environment, good governance, and better management. And it's management. the private sector that creates jobs, right? The opportunities come exactly. from the private sector. And quite a few uh, countries in the region have done this. Um, Western Balkans, um, South Caucasus, Eastern Europe have made significant improvements mm -hmm. in their uh, business environment, notwithstanding the uh, recent uh, reforms in Uzbekistan and mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, there's still more room in right. Central Asia. And a very important part of improving the business environment is improving uh, the financial sector to make yeah. sure we have well-functioning you know, well financial sectors. And uh, we've been focusing a lot on this. Uh, we've been building uh, you know, uh, inclusive financial uh, sectors and our um, spring uh, update was on this and we're going to be talking about that. We'll talk more about, about inclusion that. issues, right? Yes, and connectivity is also very important. So is access to infrastructure both uh, transport and energy. And this brings me to the fourth challenge, last but not least, climate change. Well, we see uh, that every day in our lives. Yes, and not only globally, but for our region, it's very important. For example, some for some countries in Central Asia, which rely on agriculture a lot, uh, the increases in temperatures, the reduction in rainfall is going to have important uh, economic implications. And it's not only that, because sea levels are rising. Right. So uh, with the rise in the level of the Black Sea, um, all the countries around the Black Sea region, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, uh, Georgia, are likely to be affected. Yeah. So, for example, we are embarking on an important ASA uh, now in Ukraine, uh, trying to identify the most vulnerable right. populations and to do sort of to design uh, adaptation and mitigation right. policies. So let me stop here. Well, Asli, thank you so much. Um, a lot to tackle. We have a, a complex set of challenges, but I want to understand what are those challenges in the context of Russia? Apurva, I'm coming back to you. If you can tell us a little bit more, what are the long-term challenges that Russia is facing and what are the ways to solve those? Sure, Sona. So imagine, if you will, a triangle right. with a P at each corner. Mm -hmm. Now, Russia's long-term challenges revolve around these three Ps, productivity, poverty, mm -hmm. and people. Right. Now, Russia's productivity has been low and declining even before the dual oil price and sanctions shocks in 2014. And to boost productivity, 
you require speedier actions in the areas of competition, mm -hmm. innovation, and skills. Now, on competition, Russia has actually done rather well in our own doing business rankings, mm -hmm. rising from a lowly 120th place just seven years back to a pretty respectable 31st place That's today. That's impressive. It's very impressive. But overall, competition conditions have not improved mm -hmm. as rapidly. So uh, one big reason, as uh, was mentioned by Asla, was, uh, is, is a large state footprint, Russia's large state footprint. Yeah. And the problem with the state footprint is that it's, it's pretty much present everywhere, including in, in sectors that are pretty commercial. So by one estimate, the share of the, of the state by va value added is a hefty one third and growing, especially in energy and banking. So, so rolling back the state is not ideological because you need a strong state to provide public goods and social services, right. but it has to be in the, in the right sectors and in the right way. And in fact, we have found that uh, relative to private firms, uh, state ownership is negatively associated with productivity. Right. On innovation, well, Russia spends less than half on uh, R&D that, that OECD countries mm -hmm. do. And of research the little and development. Research and development. And of the little that it spends, over 70% of it is public spending. Oh. Compare that to just 24% in the case of South Korea. Right. So no wonder then that it's only one in 10 Russian firms that report any kind of technological innovation activity compared to between three and four firms yeah. in OECD countries. On skills in various global rankings, mm -hmm. such as in uh, mathematics, reading, uh, science, Russia actually does rather well. Mm -hmm. including in our own World Bank's uh, Human Capital Index, where it ranks among the top 35. But Russian students perform below average, below the OECD average, in the softer areas mm -hmm. of collaborative problem solving and socio-emotional skills. So you would say uh, stronger skills in math and sciences, but uh, less, less so in softer. Exactly. So, so, precise, so targeted interventions in these softer areas right. would definitely help. Right. So that's the first P, productivity. Uh -huh. The second P is poverty. Uh -huh. Now we are mostly macroeconomists here and I'll confess one problem I have with macro indicators <laughs> is that they hide the fact that different people feel the economy differently. Right. Now in the case of Russia, real disposable incomes have been falling over the last few years especially and the poverty rate under its own national definition is around 13%. Uh -huh. So that's almost around 19 million people who live in poverty in Russia today. Mm -hmm. Now to half poverty over the next six years, which is a central goal of the, of the government, uh, we estimate that growth, growth rates would have to quadruple. They would have to surge to 4.4% each year for the next six years, clearly an unrealistic proposition right. in current, in, under current circumstances. But Russia can still half poverty. Mm -hmm. And it can do so via additional redistribution, for example, from social assistance and transfers. And we reckon that the cost of doing so is just a fraction of GDP, right. around 03 to 0.4% of, of GDP. And here, I, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'd just like to note that uh, we are working closely with both the federal and regional governments on precisely mm -hmm. such poverty-reducing measures. Right. And finally, the third P, mm -hmm. uh, which is people. Now, my colleagues here may, may disagree, you may disagree, but I believe that the single most underrated trend that affects us all, not just in Russia, but everywhere, is demography. Right. A different I, I think kind we actually already yeah. mentioned yes. that mm -hmm. demography uh, is an issue. A, a different kind of people power, if you will. In the case of Russia, unfavorable demographics are shrinking its talent pool as proxied by, by the working age uh, population. This means uh, less output, lower consumption, and lower growth. Mm -hmm. now, Russia mm -hmm. has taken steps to address this, for example, by increasing its pension age for both men and women, but it can do more. For example, by attracting more uh, high-skilled economic migrants. Mm -hmm. So in fact, countries that have historically been open to such migration, such as Australia and the United States, mm -hmm are now poised to enjoy the benefits of increases in the working age population. Right. So Russia can up its game on this front. So SONA is basically addressing these three P's of productivity, uh, poverty, and people slash demographics, 
is what will help Russia raise both its living standards and catch up with the rest of the world. Well, very good to know that. So uh, having poverty is within reach, uh, just the right policies are needed. Um, this is an encouraging message to have. I want to go back to Farouk and talk again about Ukraine. Um, Ukrainian economy, uh, the growth has been 2.7% in the last three years, which is not a high number, but it seems consistent uh, with across the region. But how, what can be done to increase this growth, uh, to have it faster, move faster? Can you yes. tell us your views? Thank you, Sona. Uh, Ukraine's priority right now is indeed to increase its rate of growth to a rate that people can actually feel. Usually after an economic crisis of the type that Ukraine had in 2014 mm -hmm. and 2015, we expect an economy to rebound. So people feel some sense of recovery. They feel their, uh, their uh, living standards improve over time. In Ukraine, however, after the crisis, the average rate of economic growth in tw from 2016 to 2018, as you have said, has been an anemic 2.7%. Right. This is not enough to improve people's living standards fast enough, and it's not a rate of economic growth that makes people feel that they are better off than they were five years ago. Um, in fact, if you look at the poverty rate in Ukraine, the share of the population under the poverty rate in 2018 was 17 percent. Mm. This is lower than it was at the peak of the crisis, which was 27 percent in 2015. Significantly lower. Yes, yeah. but it's still higher than it was before the crisis, 14 percent in 2013. And this is why people in Ukraine today do not feel that they were better off that they were, than they were five years ago, despite all of the progress the country has made in coming out of the hole. We believe that in order for Ukraine to improve its living standards faster, in order for Ukraine to catch up to the income levels of its European neighbors, it, it needs to grow at about 4% or more. Uh -huh. Now, how can That's Ukraine- That's ambitious. Yes, how can Ukraine um, uh, get there? Um, let me point to um, three things. First, uh, three things, agriculture, uh -huh. credit, and a level playing field for the private sector. In agriculture, Ukraine has tremendous potential. The, ag the stock of agricultural land in Ukraine is greater than in anywhere in Europe. I, I recall it being called the breadbasket of the former Soviet Union. Would you, would you say the same? I indeed, and the quality of the soil mm -hmm. is actually better than in most other countries right. because Ukraine has the largest stock of black soil uh -huh. in the entire planet. Um, but however, when you look at the Productivity in agriculture in, in Ukraine, value added per hectare in Ukraine is a fraction of that in Germany, France, and even its neighbor Poland. The problem is that there is a moratorium on the sales of agricultural land, which essentially undermines the security of land tenure, and it undermines the use of land to obtain uh, as collateral to obtain credit for smaller and medium farmers. Um, so. The priority right now in Ukraine is to lift the moratorium on agricultural land sales. Uh, this will help um, improve the incentives for investment in perennials, mm -hmm. in higher value added products, and it will allow land to be used as collateral to deliver credit to small and medium farmers that have a greater potential mm -hmm. to improve their productivity right. over time. The second area that is important is that Ukraine needs to do a lot more to increase investment and credit to the private sector. In order lending, to you mean lending. Exactly, in order to achieve this, financial intermediation has to be efficient. Mm -hmm. The banking sector has to deliver the savings of the Ukrainian population to the most productive businesses rather than the most powerful oligarchs. Right. Um, the problem is that the half of the banking sector is still in state hands and non-performing loans in the banking sector are still more than 50%. Wow. Um, the priority right now is for Ukraine to implement the state-owned bank law that was uh, approved last year, to establish independent supervisory boards in state-owned banks, which should begin to clean up non-performing loans and restructure the banks so Ukraine can attract private and foreign investment to the ownership of these banks, which will be an important channel to uh, deliver credit to the most more productive businesses in Ukraine. The third important area is for Ukraine to create a level playing field 
in the um, in the for the private sector. And what do you mean by that? Carl? What I mean for that by that is that oligarchs have been extremely powerful in the and dominant in the private sector, which crowds out potentially much more productive uh, businesses because they have preferential access to credit, they have preferential regulatory environment, and they can get around all of the red tape in the business environment that usually characterizes. A word we hear these days is demo demonopolize. <laughs> yes, on that front, Ukraine has made a lot of progress in beginning to strengthen its anti-corruption institutions. Last year, Ukraine approved a law in creating a high anti-corruption court. That anti-corruption court should begin to um, function on September 5th of this year. And I think that is when the people of Ukraine will begin to see the results of its new anti-corruption architecture. But beyond that, Ukraine needs to do even more to uh, demonopolize the large footprint of uh, state-owned enterprises, and to strengthen uh, the capacity of the anti-monopoly committee. Let me let just make one final point, right. which is the pace of reforms needs to be much faster going forward than it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why the rate of economic growth has been so anemic is because reforms that, were uh, that could have been done in 2016 and the beginning of 2017 were eventually done at 2018 or are still pending. Oh, wow. So this is why Ukraine going forward needs to do much more to accelerate the pace of economic reforms, which will deliver higher economic growth and better living standards for the Ukrainian people. Thank you, Farouk. Well, there is an excellent opportunity. There is a new president, there is a new Rada, new parliament. So Ukrainian people are hopeful that this will uh, take place faster and more efficient. Um, we are about to conclude our session, but I want to come back to all of you with one last message that you want to share. And please, please keep it brief. But we want to hear, um, first of all, what is unique about those countries that you spoke about just now? And what is one message of hope that you can leave us with? Apurva, shall we start with you? Russia is a big country uh, you gave us the good uh, news and the bad news but what's unique about Russia what's the message of hope so so what's unique about Russia well Russia is more than a country it's actually a federation composed of 80 mm -hmm. very diverse regions mm -hmm. and being unaware of it Sona is like being unaware that a Matryoshka doll a Russian nesting doll is not empty so on one hand you have regions like Sakhalin that mm -hmm. have living standards comparable to Singapore's on the other hand you have regions like the English Republic, which have living standards closer to Honduras. So it's an incredibly diverse country. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it has a turbulent past. Uh, it has to deal with the harsh climatic conditions. Yeah. The world's coldest uh, city is Yakutsk right. in, in yeah. Siberia. So even the uh, seemingly simple task of laying down basic infrastructure in the world's largest country uh, takes on a completely unique dimension. Mm -hmm. On a message of hope, uh, you know, one of my Russian friends told me that being hopeful is like waiting for summer in St. Petersburg. <laughs> Nine months of anticipation, followed by three months of disappointment. But you know, I'm an optimist. And what could be more hopeful than the fact that halving poverty in the world's largest country is within reach? And by the way, I've been to St. Petersburg in summer and it's beautiful. Well, I am yet to go, but I'm impatiently waiting for that opportunity. Uh, Farouk, in a couple of words, um, new Rada, new president, new beginning, what's the message of hope? I think the message of hope is the Ukrainian people. It is the Ukrainian people that since the Euromaidan revolution of 2014 and 2015 have delivered the change that uh, Ukraine needs. Um, it is the constant engagement of Ukrainian civil society in pushing for change. Mm -hmm. And the change that we've seen in Ukraine this year is a result of the Ukrainian people saying that they have not seen change fast enough. Right. So going forward, I think the message of hope is the new voice and, uh, and activism of the Ukrainian people that will really move Ukraine forward and deliver the change and the economic growth that they really deserve. That's excellent. That's a real citizen engagement right there. And Asli, coming back to you for Turkey, you already gave us great achievements. Uh, what's the one message of hope that you want to leave us with? Well, I am very hopeful about Turkey in the long run, and there are a number of reasons. First, it has a very young population, mm -hmm. a vibrant private sector. It's a middle-income country uh, that is 
has a lot of potential for growth. And importantly, the geography. Turkey sits in the middle of Asia and uh, Europe mm -hmm. with access to both and bringing both together. So there's always going to be global interest and in investment in Turkey, provided the right policies are followed. Excellent. Well, this is very positive. We are looking forward to 2020 when the growth is uh, supposed to pick up in Europe and Central Asia. That concludes our conversation. Thank you so much to our panelists who traveled from uh, their respective countries to be here with us. Thank you for your time. And we will continue this conversation in coming months. Thank you. Thank you. And sir. we will now uh, move to the second segment of our conversation. We're going to come back with Asli and talk about financial inclusion. This is a very important topic and it affects growth. Let us hear what it means for us. Morning, and we are now back in Washington. I am joined again with Asli Demir Gucukunt, uh, Chief Economist for Europe and Central Asia. We want to talk about financial inclusion. This is a topic of great significance for our region. And in fact, uh, during spring meetings in April 2019, we released a study, an update, that talks about trends of financial inclusion across the region and explains the reasons behind it. As, the, um, as of 2017, Global Findex shows that still 116 million people in ECA do not have a bank account. That's a really large number. And uh, not only that, but 60% of these people are women. Why is this happening? Can you tell us? And why do we need to care about financial inclusion? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, financial inclusion, the way we define it, uh, the proportion of people who have access to use financial services mm -hmm. is very important uh, to promote uh, growth and reduce poverty. Mm -hmm. Without uh, finance, you cannot invest in promising uh, business opportunities. Uh, you need finance to remain healthy. Mm -hmm. You need finance to be able to invest in your education. You know, um, financial services help people to uh, prepare for their old age. Mm -hmm. um, they are important to uh, deal with financial emergencies. So uh, inclusion uh, is a very important contributor to inclusive growth. Right. Um, now, uh, you mentioned women, right. and indeed, uh, in financial inclusion, we do see there is a, a stubborn uh, gender gap. Oh. So, uh, globally, uh, in developing countries, uh, women's financial inclusion tends to be 9 percentage points mm -hmm. lower than men's uh, financial inclusion in developing countries. Um, in ECA region, um, you know, some countries are doing better than others. For example, in Russia, we don't see a uh, difference, right. whereas... When not we, at all? Uh, no. No, nothing significant. Right. Uh, and when we look at Armenia, there is a 15 percentage point difference. What's most surprising, though, is Turkey, because there is a 29 percentage point difference oh, between wow. men and women's financial inclusion. About 84% of uh, men have a uh, 
uh, account, whereas mm -hmm. only 53 percent of right. women do. So um, that is a, a cause for concern, uh, particularly given Turkey's income level. And this is almost the worst uh, fi uh, difference uh, for all countries around mm -hmm. the world. So why is that? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons is that um, you know, the uh, women are not uh, included in the labor force. About uh, close to 90% of the women who are unbanked are not mm -hmm. working. Right. Um, there are, of course, also cultural uh, mm -hmm. issues because when we ask uh, these unbanked women why they do not have a bank account, uh, close to 80% of them say that because there is somebody else in the family who mm -hmm. has a bank account. Now, uh, that's not a good reason we but know. But you don't count that as them being included, right? No, they're not. I mean, in order to be included, you have to have your own account or a joint account. Right. And we know this is very important for empowerment right. So and all the development outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I guess there is a room for uh, awareness training, literacy training. Now, there is also hope, though, because, um, again, close to 90% of the women who are not banked mm -hmm. have a mobile phone. This is not always the case. For example, in Africa, we know that women don't have a mobile phone. So these people who are, these women who are not included in the financial sector in Turkey have a mobile phone. So connecting these things to internet, designing um, um, different instruments that can be used through the mobile phones has the promise to improve the inclusion of the women as well. Yeah. Well, this was uh, interesting. Um, uh, fascinating, actually. Um, how do you measure uh, financial inclusion? What are some of the metrics that you put in place to understand? Yeah, uh, well, um, having an account is the first step mm -hmm. into the formal financial system. So uh, that's why it's always used as a marker of financial right. inclusion, the proportion of people who have a bank account. Right. Um, that's how you get your wages, mm -hmm. that you, uh, that's how you get your uh, payments, how you receive uh, you know, uh, money from friends and family. It's also the first step into uh, borrowing and saving. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how we uh, generally uh, measure financial inclusion. Excellent. Um, I want to go back and understand a little bit how financial inclusion really goes down to the details of countries. Uh, if okay. you can tell, what are yeah. the trends? We This is a very large region, right? We go from all the way from EU countries to Central Asia, and the trends might be different. If you can tell us more about that. Yes. Um, well, uh, globally, um, the latest numbers show that 69% uh, of the adult population in the world have a bank account. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is... Um, uh, when you look at ECHA, the numbers are 65% for the developing and emerging uh, countries in ECHA. Mm -hmm. Of course, ECHA is a, a very diverse region. Right. For the high-income countries, you have uh, more or less universal access with everybody having a bank account. Now, what people don't always recognize is that um, ECHA is also home to some sub-regions that are globally top performers in terms of having increased their uh, inclusion mm -hmm. from a very low base. And these are uh, South Caucasus in Central Asia. Uh, when you look at these two sub-regions, um, they started about uh, with a 20% inclusion when we first started measuring these things with Global Findex in 2011. And by 2017, which is the latest right. data we have right now, they've gone over 40%. So uh, this is a big increase mm -hmm. over a uh, period of time. And even when you look at within the sub-regions, you see quite a bit of diversity, though. For example, um, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan have managed to increase their financial inclusion to 40%, um, although they've started with single digits. Right. Uh, when we first started wow. measuring in 2011. Within how many? Oh, so within yeah, six to, years? Yeah, 2011 to 2017. Wow, that's impressive. Impressive increase. Uh, now, in the same uh, sub-region, Uzbekistan has been growing more slowly, and Kazakhstan, with 59% financial inclusion, is doing well, but there is room to do much better given the high income level of Kazakhstan. Right. So, again, for example, when you look at uh, Caucasus, uh, you know, Armenia, Georgia are doing doing very well, but um, Azerbaijan is, um, you know, doing uh, more, growing more slowly in terms mm -hmm. of financial inclusion. So um, there is a lot of room for mm -hmm. countries to learn from each other because of these diverse mm -hmm. experiences. So it's very interesting. 
Well, thank you for that overview. Um, now we would like to better understand what policies do you think that the countries should take uh, in order to enhance and uh, broaden financial inclusion? Yes, um, let me mention three. One is the importance of focusing on the fundamentals. So we want to make sure that um, you know, the interventions address market failures and policy failures. What are there? So you, you want to make sure the, um, the regulations, the legal environment is uh, there, the information mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure is there. Um, and it's very important to also have healthy competition right. in the financial sector so that the you know, the financial sector is incentivized to reach out and mm -hmm. uh, provide greater uh, inclusion. Second, um, you know, technology is helpful in uh, expanding financial inclusion. And for that, we want to make sure that these uh, products are safer, transparent, available. So that also requires uh, provision of infrastructure, mm -hmm. agent networks, correspondent banking. Um, so these are important. And third, I'd say uh, it's very important for individuals to understand mm -hmm. uh, the, what it, it is that they're using in terms so financial of financial literacy. Exactly. Right. Financial literacy and also consumer protection mm -hmm. because you don't want predatory lending right. in uh, different practices. So there, uh, these, that th those products need to be designed in a way to uh, um, to appeal to people with low numeracy and literacy skills. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our World Bank is a major development partner in these countries. Um, how does the World Bank partner with um, countries in Europe and Central Asia to enhance policies? What is the assistance that we give? Yes, well, the, um, the good news is, although uh, it's very difficult to actually engage in financial sector reform, we've just heard uh, it's, it's hard when you talk about uh, privatization mm -hmm. of banks, it's hard when you're trying to restructure banking systems. When you want to do uh, more to improve financial inclusion, there is a lot of receptivity on the part of our client mm -hmm. countries. I was just in um, Astana at, mm -hmm. for the Astana Economic Forum at a round table that was um, put together by the AMF, IMF, bringing together all the central Nur bank Sultan. Governments. Exactly. <laughs> And uh, the, the, the panel was supposed to be about uh, inclusive growth. Everybody wanted to talk about financial inclusion. So we can engage very effectively with our clients on this. And um, ever since we've started measuring financial inclusion, uh, many countries have started introducing national financial inclusion strategies. Mm -hmm. So for example, 45 countries globally have introduced them. Another 35 countries are working on them. So um, measurement uh, through Global Findex and our work in there has increased policy awareness in this issue. And we are working very closely with our client countries in the ECHA region. Uh, we've partnered with Russia in its recent national financial inclusion strategy. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, strategies which bring together all the stakeholders, identify what are the constraints in achieving better financial inclusion, and then lay down a, a prioritized path to mm -hmm. uh, promote financial yes. inclusion. Um, again, in the region we're working with um, Armenia, Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. um, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, there's uh, talk starting with Kazakhstan. So there is a lot of uh, work going on on the operational front. And also importantly, we're starting a major um, analytical piece mm -hmm. in South Caucasus and Central Asia, those two sub-regions which have seen significant increases uh, from a very low base, uh, to better understand the, how the countries have, that made those changes were able to make them and how we can sort of drive lessons for the others so that we can contribute to the design of national uh, strategy. And I'm, I'm sure we can also have lessons learned, countries sharing lessons learned with each exactly. other, what has worked, what has not. Exactly. Um, I want to ask you one concluding question and uh, we have uh, probably a couple of, uh, just less than a minute to answer, so I want a quick answer. Um, okay. Technology drives everything these days, uh, we see it every day. One last message on how technology can 
help enhance financial inclusion. Okay, we have very little time. So digitalization yes. uh, is very important. Um, and we have seen that a lot of the countries which have made the most mm -hmm. increases have also increased digitalization. Right. One last hopeful message, 80% of the uh, people who are unbanked in the ECA region mm -hmm. have a mobile phone. Okay, so that's the way to go, digitalization, <laughs> um, using your bank account on uh, your yes, mobile. Yes, certainly so. there is hope there. Excellent. Asli, this, this was very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, financial inclusion has all kinds of other spillover benefits in terms of inclusion in the region, so definitely an area that we are actively engaged in. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your insights on all the other aspects that we chatted today about. Thank you very much, Sana. And uh, this uh, is uh, concluding the segment on Europe and Central Asia, Econathon 2019. This is also taking us to the last hour of Econathon, where we will hear from many other uh, colleagues uh, and conclude uh, the 24-hour marathon of economics that we have run. Thank you so much for joining us in Washington. Uh, we shall see you soon. Thank you very much.